afternoon, everyone. We will restart. Uh, so we're going to talk about automating chaos engineering with a service mesh. And I wonder, like, if people uh, were at the talk yesterday. One. The other, I'm going to ask you to leave. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. So we're going to start. The, the plan for today is to introduce the concept of a service mesh and see how the evolution of uh, from, from the code perspective to the infrastructure. And with that, it's going to set the base for uh, chaos engineering, which is a fault injection demo. And uh, Sylvain is going to continue with the automation of that uh, experiment with the chaos toolkit. So Sylvain, you might want to introduce yourself. Yep. I might. Uh, for those who were there yesterday. The mic, the mic. Hello. Uh, yeah, so if you were there uh, yesterday, like uh, Julian said, you probably know me otherwise. Uh, so my name is Sylvain Leguarche. I'm the Chaos IQ CTO. And Chaos IQ does a few projects around Chaos Engineering, like Chaos Toolkit, the Chaos Platform, and a Chaos Hub. So I'll be demoing uh, Chaos Toolkit a bit of the Chaos Platform today. And I'll, I'll let you continue. Thank you. Um, my name is Julien. I live in Stockholm. I work for a Swiss company called 56K Cloud. And this is my colleague, Derek. He took his picture so that uh, he was doing a Docker pool image on, on that picture. So he can say that he's doing containers in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> for real. So, so uh, to, to get more, more serious, we, there is this uh, idea that uh, doing microservices is, is fast and easy. But actually, I would like to ask, how long do you think it takes to go from a monolith to a microservice architecture? Years, okay, and still there, you're not fully, you cannot fully get rid of the of the monolith. You still have that that core that's there, but you build a whole ecosystem of microservices around it, and that brings to you know now that you have split everything, you you fall into you have problem with the network, because if you look at the eight fallacy of distributed system, the first one is the network is reliable, and that's the biggest lie that people tell you you know it's not going to happen. And the proof is that 20 years, 22 years ago, an RFC came, which is called, at the bottom, 12th Networking Truth. It's basically those, those truths that you know that you're not going to be faster than the speed of light. That is, you know, even if your manager say, but maybe if you split proton, they go twice as fast. No, it, it's going to be the same. So with those microservices, we came and the container helped to, for the deployment and the repeatability. And once you have the container, you, you, they brought a whole new set of questions that you need to make decisions to. And one of them is uh, scheduling. So how do you deal with secret? How do you make them resilient? And how do you make those services talk to each other? And this is where we have Kubernetes. Kubernetes, if you have Kubernetes, doesn't mean that those problems are trivial, but at least they provide you a standard API to solve the problem. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. But also, once you have Kubernetes, this is not the silver bullet. I know we are at KubeCon, I already see people like, he's talking bad about Kubernetes. <laughs> so don't worry, I, I'm not going to trash. Kubernetes is a brilliant, brilliant tool, and so many people agree on it that it makes it super convenient to build on top of it. So if you, if you want to do, for instance, tracing, or if you want to know your metrics, or how to do canary release and uh, service authentication, Kubernetes doesn't tell you anything. You, you have to figure it out yourself. So what people do is usually they use code to solve those problems. But with code came, come a, a lot of problems as well. Like you have a ton of language, ton of uh, libraries, framework, and they don't match, and you never update them. Because even if, if it doesn't force you to upgra upgrade, it's is basically it works so let's not fix something that's not broken and all the little thing that lets you for instance uh, draining re request you know if you if you, when you deploy you need to make sure that all the network is drained and that the the previous requests are not cut so that you don't send a 500 to your customer and that can impact your error budget so you you need to take care of it and even if you go to someone and say okay can you help me fix because between deployment we see something uh, going on and you say, oh, for me it works fine, or it works on my machine. <laughs> well, good, 
back up your email because your laptop is going to production now. <laughs> yeah. Feel free. I have plenty of those. <laughs> and so the, the idea of a, of a service mesh is also that you, you, you want to extract the code and make it to, to remove those concerns from the application. And for that, we move it to the infrastructure. So instead of having code that you need to import and deal with, it becomes a separate piece that you deploy separately. And that is the pattern that emerged, the sidecar proxy. So you see, instead of service A talking directly to service B, you go through a proxy, and that allows for a lot of uh, observability. You know all the traffic that goes in and out. You can do interesting things like uh, mutual TLS and, and so on and so forth. So that's where Envoy came. And so Envoy is the state that the network should be transparent to the application. Well, some manner tweak that you need to do, but it's a really great tool and people have adopting it, uh, have adopted and provide a tremendous amount of value uh, in, in your application. But of course, once you have a tons of microservices and each of them have a sidecar proxy, how do you manage the fleet of them? Because you need to, to schedule them, you, ne you need to organize them, synchronize them. And so that's the service mesh. If you want to know how to describe a service mesh, you need to answer what problem does it solve? And that is the communication between services. It's a network for services, not for byte. You are in a higher level of abstraction. And so let's do the demo. So we can generate some traffic. So uh, maybe you saw the the Envoy. So here you have, we're going to show you Envoy and it's just a simple HTTP bin application that when you query it, it sends you back the, the result depending on the route. So here status code 200 is going to send me a 200 code. And if I curl that, you see that I curl to receive the header. And if I go and query if I start Envoy, boom, it crash because, and it says here, value required. So Envoy doesn't work out of the box. You need to configure it. You need to tell it what to do. And the way to tell it what to do is YAML. So you have listeners. That is basically how you, you have, is the entry point to which you, you talk in Envoy. And then you can specify routes. And here you see, I, I specify a retry policy on 500 code. I retry three times. So now, instead of having tons of code that are really hard to test, you have just declarative language that allows you to, to specify those things. And the cluster is basically the destination where when you query this port, it sends you to that route. So let's start Envoy. Now it starts. And we're going to run. Oh. Sorry, wrong one. And now you see that if you query, Envoy has added a header. So it, it rewrites things on the fly. And that's what makes it a really powerful proxy because you don't need to care about you know, doing that in the code. You can just specify and it, it separates from the business logic. And so now I'm querying for getting a 500 code. And you can see that if I check for the metrics, you see that all that, it, all those observability is stored in Envoy that you can query by just specifying the slash tags. So if you see here, I query Envoy. Before I was querying, here I query the HTTP bin directly. So I'm talking to HTTP bin through Envoy. And that's what uh, allows for different uh, routing condition. So now that we see Envoy, STO is the control plane that come and control all the Envoys. And there is this uh, application called Book Info. And you can see that for every version, it's load balancing between three versions. This is the, actually the schema of the, the calls. So if you see, you can see that uh, some uh, 25% of the traffic is going to those routes. But let's generate some more. So this is a small tool uh, that's supposed to test latency. And from now, 
if you want to see a nice trick, you do that, and now it moves. That is so great. You have no idea. Because now it moves, everybody wants it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm quite optimist uh, usually, so don't worry. It's going to get better. <laughs> but so you see that we are round robbing through all those versions. And the idea is that we want to have control of the we want to have control of the route that we have. So here, I want to, st to send everything to V1. So let's go. Uh, which one is this? Traffic to V1, OK. So before, I had some uh, virtual service. And now, with Istio, I define more virtual service that pin all the traffic to a version. So now, if I redo the test, you can see that very quickly all the traffic is going to get pinned to the version 1. See, already you see 0% and 50% here. So that that's give you um, the control over the network. But with great power comes great responsibility. So now we are in charge of the network. You can also shoot yourself in the foot. With that, we can do uh, more advanced routing. And that is where the Envoy really shine. is that maybe you don't see. Whoa. So here, you can specify in a few lines of code how to match a header in HTTP. And this header is actually say, match the user JSON. And if it match, send it to V2. So if I go to the, to the bookstore info, you see that I'm always on, the, on one version, because now the stars don't move. If I go to here, I'm authenticated as JSON. JSON is doing to another version. So now you can specify and have a user that has another version, which leaves you very much in control of what you want to test into the system. You can actually reproduce and have all the, the containers in the same cluster with different versions. So basically, having different environment is completely uh, like you, you have to rethink the concept because you can have everything in Kubernetes, just have those rules saying that staging and, and production are, are different depending on the user or the traffic. Sorry? Flighting? Yeah, 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 the, the, the rollout like that. But I mean, n that's not the use case for everybody. Uh, I mean, your, your bank doesn't say, how to, let's see how we handle money today. You know, <laughs> it's just <laughs> not something you want. Although they do change the user interface. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> but so, and the, the nice thing with that is it, it's not uh, a super advanced concept. You see that I'm going to take the cookie session and paste it into the JSON uh, web token page. And if you see, and you can see that here, the JSON is here. So you can very easily encrypt and decrypt those headers with the G JWT. That's what Envoy support. But you can write your extension in uh, Envoy and um, create your own authentication mechanism, which is not what I recommend, by the way. And let's say that now you, you are testing with uh, this user JSON and a security patch uh, comes out. So you need to migrate your user, but JSON is still pinned to version 2. So what you can do is, sorry, all the user now are migrated to version 3 while you are still on your version. So you, you can push new version while you're still working on that. On, on, on your version. And that was for the concept. Is that OK so far? You understand service mesh? Good. So this is where the, the chaos engineering part is a little bit uh, comes into play and why a service mesh is a great tool for that. Because it comes with the, the primitive defined for the, the, the fault injection. So let's say that now I want. I want JSON to have a seven second delay for every of his requests. 
I know it's really mean, but it's for the purpose of this demo. <laughs> Sacrifice himself. So you can see here, I'm not able to, to refresh. And the reason is that there is a timeout that's going to get triggered. And all of that is also, you can visualize very well all the traffic that's going through. And you see here, there is an error that's appeared. And you can see that the developer of the application made uh, the architecture in such a way that an error doesn't crash the site. So you, you get an error, but you still display something to your user, which is a completely new level as opposed to, oh, you have the front end, you have the back end. Now you, you see the whole system at once, and you can make informed decision about what your users see. And that leads to a lot of reliability, because now your engineers can go and figure out, like, is that the user experience that you want to give to users? As soon as they can see that, it's easy for them to go and pinpoint where, where is the bottleneck. And, you know, we saw this, those examples on, on the internet and everything, but I, I think that what's really interesting is that I can actually SSH into one of the containers that is the ingress controller. And I have no problem to query the, the Envoy proxy. This is something that you have control over. So uh, here I have all the help. And if you look at the stats, that's basically all the metrics that are stored in Envoy. So you can make some really interesting auto-scaling uh, metric because now you know how many requests you have at any given time. And those requests are stored in Prometheus. You can tell Kubernetes to say scale depending on how many requests you have. That is the, uh, completely new because those things are really hard to get right. You know, it's not that you cannot do it is that it, it takes a lot to get it right. There is a lot of little nuance that you need to fine tune and, and discover for, in order to, to make it reliable. And the last thing I'm going to show before giving uh, the hands to uh, Sylvain is that when you SSH into the, the box by itself and you want to see what um, Envoy is doing, uh, actually Istio is doing under the hood, you see that you have some Kubernetes IP tables here, but Envoy used the NAT table and that is a monster. So that's about 100 rules that Istio inject and you know, it, it depends on which level of abstraction you want to work with, which, which level of abstraction you want to create chaos. Usually the idea is to create chaos in a lower, um, lower level of abstraction, see the result in the upper layer that we did. We create a timeout into the, the system and we see the result in the application layer. So that's really powerful in order to you know, break down the system because what I did here was not very, I would say, impressive. All I did was add a timeout somewhere. But the problem is that in the code, most of the, the libraries that we use have a default timeout. I'm pretty sure nobody knows what they are. And those, you know, I think it's uh, GitHub that uh, two months ago had an outage because of seven, seven second delay that create a replication of MySQL database and everything blew up. So those things uh, seem so um, insignificant, but it's like the butterfly effect. Everything can blow up from there. And it's kind of, it might seem daunting at first, but little by little, you can easily get to, to providing a better service to your customer. So let's zoom out a little. And also, if you get started, don't, don't worry, because even if you do chaos engineering, it doesn't mean that from now on, everything is going to be perfect, and you're never going to fail, because it's not true. And I, I can show you this. You know, I don't know if you can read. But basically, a QA engineer walks into a bar, order a beer, order zero beer, order 9999 beers, order a lizard, order minus one beer, order a random string. First real customer rogues in and asks where the bathroom is. The bar bursts into flames and killing everyone. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the point. You, you, you didn't prev like work on that case. So of course, something unexpected happened. And that's the point you have something that you don't know and you don't, have the, you don't even know how to ask the question about what you don't know. That's why we call it an experiment. You try out and figure out, wow, what happens if I mess up one of the IP table of Istio? 
with something like still work or w what happened? And so it's the, it's the discovery phase. And of course, if you want, like, you know, it doesn't prevent you. Like people will use your service in a way that you definitely not <laughs> expect. And it is, it's just like, t take it lighthearted. It's, it's all about working in teams and helping everyone. So, <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> so, so, you know, we come up with the SLI, SLO, and SLA, and, and basically what it means is y you can state your experiment, your hypothesis that you want to test. And those things translate to business need, and, and it, your SLA is basically money that you're going to give back. So those impact uh, the business as well, and I hope that it will bring a new way of organizational change, because it's not about technical uh, change. You, you can do everything on your own, but if your organization doesn't help out, it's like repeating a fire drill and you're the only one outside the building. It's not going to help, you know, you need, it's everybody to, that has to try the system. So now I'm going to leave the president to Yeah, thank you for not running away. Uh, I'm sure some some have, um, but I know the names. All right, so um, are we going to see anything actually? Do we? Oh, yesterday it took me like three attempts. All right, I'll try to make it a bit bigger, I guess. Uh, how do I do that? Yeah. Usually, but you know, this is Linux, so yeah. <laughs> I've got ten, ten fingers. <laughs> yeah, actually, you're right. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, um, I've got the don't 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 watch it yet. Uh, so I've got no slides uh, because yesterday I had too many slides. Um, I've got the terrible job of making it boring now uh, through automation. Uh, everything Julian has done, uh, we're going to try to automate because. There's no point in trying to do that if you're not going to think in automation. Uh, the, the whole point of chaos engineering is try to have a protocol of sort, an experimental protocol to actually make sense of what you're seeing. If you do everything manually, there's a lot of room for mistakes, a lot of room for, oh, that parameter did change, or, you know, that sort of, you know, oh, what did I do last time? Oh, and you're going to try to look at your history and you won't make sense any of it. So what you really want is, is actually uh, start automating. And it so happens that we have a tool, and I'm going to try again. Oh, it's crazy, it's a different one. Oh no, I'm blown away. All right, um, so, so the idea here is to say, like I said, we have an experimental protocol. So the point of the experimental protocol is to say we've got a system, right, or system that looks normal, for whatever normal means to you. And uh, we're going to degrade or change some condition in our system, usually one condition only, because otherwise you won't be able to actually make sense of what happened. So you're going to change something, and that's what we're going to do, and then rerun the, the hypothesis you made initially and see if you've changed. If it's still normal, then either you ask the wrong questions, so you, you actually attempted to change something that has nothing to do with what you're trying to understand, or you ask the right question and you learn that your system can, can so survive or cope with, with that error or that degradation. If the system has deviated, then you may have actually found a weakness in your system. And then that's where you start making analysis. So that's what we're trying to do here with uh, the, the tool called Chaos Toolkit. It's a declarative format. Uh, it has pros and cons. Uh, the pros is that you can focus really on the, the domain itself for chaos engineering. The cons is, you know, it's, it, it is limited in some fashion. Uh, usually pre pre people prefer writing code, but it actually has worked well so far. So we'll, we carry on with that. So it's JSON here, you can do YAML if that's your poison, that's exactly the same. 
So the idea here is to declare, and I'm going to um, highlight some, uh, some, some sections. We are going to actually hide those for now. Right, that one as well. So here, we've got what we call the steady state hypothesis. So it's a bit verbose, but basically it's your baseline. What your system looks like when it's normal. And you make the decision of looking at specific aspect of your system to make that decision, it looks normal. It doesn't mean that your entire system needs to be normal. It may be just an angle of your system. Uh, usually it's, it's nice to actually recoup that with your SLI here. To say, as a business, this is what matters to us. But it can also be very technical if you're you know, doing something in, only internally. So in this case, we saw earlier that when we introduce a delay, obviously, you know, bad things happen. Uh, as a business, we made a promise to our users that they will get the, 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 the product page and the reviews in one, under one second. That's what we tell them. We are performant. So what happens is, obvi is obviously if we send a, a delay, we know exactly what's going to happen. But that's uh, a trivial example for the sake of the demo here. Basically, what I'm doing in, in this example is simply taking what uh, Julian has showed you and transforming that into something that you can automate. So uh, in this case, we have what we call a probe that simply says, fetch uh, the product page for JSON. And that one is implemented in, uh, oh, that one is not the one I wanted to show you. It's a different one. But that's basically the same. Sorry, coming back. There you go. So here, this one says, uh, simply calls a Python function. Here. Why are we using Python? Sometimes we can use simply HTTP if you know you're making a, a call, or you can call a process as well. But if you want something a bit, you know, more, uh, you know, more, more evolved, you're going to call a, a Python function. And it's really just a function. There is no class, there's no state. It's just a function you implement to say, this is what I'm doing to actually collect data here. And you can have as many as you need. Uh, what happens is, if that is false, the first time it runs, it bails. There's no way we can learn from our system if it's already not normal. So the first time it runs, it either passes and goes on, or it fails and simply says, I can't, I can't learn anything from that. All right, so once you've done that, we go to the method, which is basically, oh, forget about that for now. We have another set of activity, which is, a, is an action. I'm sorry, not very good with uh, laptop. And this is what, what basically here, we're doing exactly what Julian has done. It's just written in Python in this case. We call the API of Istio, but that's exactly the same. We're introducing a, a delay for JSON of five seconds in this case. And that's basically it. And on rollback, we simply remove that rule that we created. Rollback is a terrible term here. We should have called that remediation or something else because it makes a promise you won't be able to cope with. If your system went, went away, we're not going to roll it back. What we do is we try to undo what we started to do. So be careful here. Rollback is not like a crazy tool you can do a lot of things with. All right, so what does it look like when we actually run that? All right, so uh, the, the, the command is called chaos. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty explicit, I guess. Uh, we're going to do that, and we just run it, and hopefully it will actually go through. First of all, at, on the top right, you see that we send a message to Slack. That's good for visibility. Okay. And it runs that file we saw, you know, incrementally and basically sequentially. So everything you saw in the file is what is run there. There's nothing new here. What is interesting here is it does tell you at the end, so the first thing it says, oh, well, the system looked normal. So indeed, we could actually return under one second. Then we introduce that, that, that error here. Um, which one is it? Inject fault, this one. And we see that when we run again the, the baseline, now it fails. So obviously we knew that would happen, but that tells you something that when that condition happens, you know, this is how your system is impacted. Now we've got the same, sec you know, the same error with, instead of sending, a, a creating a delay, we're going to actually, um, what is it? Uh, return an HTTP error. And we'll see a difference here. Because what we say uh, is we still need the response under one second. We're not introducing a delay here. We're introducing a fault in, into one of the subservice. In this case, 
we show that our system can cope with that. Because like Julian showed, the way it's been built means that you always get a response as a user. It's just you're going to get less data shown. You won't see the reviews, but you still get the page. And you still get that under one second. So that's interesting because here we, s we know, now we don't have a hunch, we know that we can cope from a user perspective. We can cope with at least the review service sending back a 404. That was the case, I think, uh, I was setting up here. So we learned that our system can sort of cope to a certain degree. And we can go back to the business and say, is that OK with you if our users get part of the results they expected? If that's OK, then we're good with that. We know we can sustain that error. And that's basically how you, you, you automate with a Chaos Toolkit. It's exactly all the way, all the time that way. So you, you simply define your state, you know, your state, and then you define you know, how, you know, which data you're going to collect and how you're going to impact the system. That's what you do. And usually it's written in Python. Our talks about Golang or any other language, uh, but you know, Python is better, so. Uh. <laughs> Uh, right, so at this stage, we're good. We know, you know, we've got something on our machine. Uh, but it'd be nice if we could, you know, communicate that. Uh, that won't work. That's not the one I want. Uh, yeah. So we can create reports here, uh, PDF reports or other sort of reports, apparently not JS. Uh, but <clears throat> when we do that, I don't know if it's going to open the right window, so bear with me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what it did here is simply fold it I'll go on, I'll go on, because it's terrible, zoom. Uh, yeah, whatever. I think it should go. So in the, um, I'll show you data that is interesting here. I'm gone. Right. So in the, in the, in the specification of the, the experiment, what you can add as well is just a block saying, what do I contribute with this experiment? And what do I contribute to? So those are things that you care about as a company, as, as a team. So it could be reliability, things like that. And you simply you know, create, uh, I'll try to zoom again. You're simply saying, I'm interested in those reliability, performance, and, and, and you know, other things. And you give them a weight. That's interesting because once you start having a lot of experiments, you can have through those punch cards and through those reports a fairly quick understanding of where you're putting your effort on. So if you define that, for example, security is important and you see very little done, you can start going back to say, well, we need to put more effort into that sort of you know, contribution here. We're doing a lot on reliability, so we're doing a lot of chaos and experiments on that, but we don't do enough on, ex on security. So that sort of thing. And after that is basically the logs of, of your experiments. So it shows you when it started, you know, its failure, uh, and it shows you if you collected you know, data as you run, so you can see, for example, in this case, that we collected the state of the of Istio, the service itself. So that's basically a Kubernetes you know, resource here. And you can see whether or not it, it worked. So in this case, we have no fault injected. Then we inject the fault, and we come back, and we have that delay fault we were talking about. It's just a, new, a nice way when you have got that report and you send it out, people can figure out what did you do. You know, and start making sense and start the analysis, which is the human side that is interesting here. And before I, I leave you to it with that, uh, once you've got that, there's a one last thing that is interesting is the Chaos Toolkit, again, is an isolation. You run that on a machine. What you really want after that is a platform to automate schedule and, you know, and allow collaboration. So what, what we have is a Chaos platform, which is you know, the big sister of, of Chaos Toolkit, if we will. Uh, and it's, that's the one. Uh, it allows you to simply, it has, it's, a, it's a control plane with an API for chaos engineering. So what it gives you, it's, it's, it's a way to upload your experiments and share that with your, you know, your teams, organization, however you want to see it, and then schedule them. So for example, uh, if I'm running that here, what I'm saying is I'm going to, those are IDs obviously, but they are exactly, that's the experiments I showed you, I've uploaded them, and they're going to be run that way. So here I'm saying you're going to run that experiment every minute of every day, of every week, of every year, you know. But you're going to do that three times. So what's the point of, of doing that every minute if it's three times only? But it's a, the fun of the demo. And you just basically, uh, you schedule that, and then you come back here, and hopefully 
demo effect won't, you know, won't kick me. What we see is those two on the top are simply the control plane. That's a reduced queue. That's what I'm using to schedule. So I'm putting the, the schedule into a queue, and that's get distributed between those workers. That's all it does. And the experiment is going to be run within one of those workers, which can be distributed across your, you know, your system. And in this case, it <laughs> we'll have to wait because, because I say every minute, uh, it needs to. It needs to go back to twenty seconds. Please bear with me. <laughs> but the idea here is, it's going to schedule that as you want and going to run that and report back the result to the platform. And obviously, after that, you've got a UI to actually exp you know, express all those results with and share those results. So it's really what you you want. If you do think it's in isolation only, you you're talking to yourself. Really, cost engineering is a collaborative thing you want to do with everyone else, right? So that's what we see here. On the right is a log of the chaos toolkit that we didn't see earlier because it was on the debug mode. But that's exactly what happens. So it's simply running that for you now. And you can leave it. It's going to do that continuously. And that's what you want to make sure that it always works that way. So obviously, you might think, oh, it's a bit like testing. It's really not in a sense where with chaos engineering, you're asking a question about something you don't know. And you're trying to explore your system, right? You're not making an assumption necessarily. And that's it, really. Uh, once you've got that, and for those who were here yesterday, and we talked about the idea of sharing our knowledge. So if you want here, basically the, the idea is, let's say I've got that experiment on Istio. And I've become a master of Istio. You're not. It'd be, a, it'd be so cool if I could actually upload that somewhere. And you could just take it and run it. Because it means my knowledge of Istio, of its failure, of its you know, weak points, could actually become something you can action and run for yourself. So that's something you want to do after that. Once you've done you know, the whole thing, you want to share those, your, those experiments, those findings, to actually contribute back to the world. Or at least within your organization. <laughs> if you're not you know, keen on the world itself. Right, I think that's, that's enough for me. Uh, I, you know, if you want to know more about the Chaos Toolkit and Chaos Platform, just come talk to me or come on our Slack. But basically, that's the idea. We start with what Julian expressed, all the problem you know, that we need from our platform, that, have, uh, that pl our platform have, you know, become more and more abstracted, more and more complex. So we have APIs like the one from SEO about fault injection. And then we can start automating, because that's what we want to do. We make it boring. But that gives us a lot of feedback. There you go. Thank you very much for, for your time.